Hello, everyone. Thank you for participating in today's World Glaucoma Week session by the IAPB North America region. This World Glaucoma Week of March 8 through 14, the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness is partnering with international organizations and experts in glaucoma care to draw a spotlight on the third leading cause of blindness. Focus on Glaucoma marks the week with a series of activities, lectures, webinars, blog posts, and more. IEPB is running this initiative with partners Allergan, SEVA, International Center for Eye Health, and the World Glaucoma Association. We're very delighted that you all are able to attend. I serve as chair of the North America region of the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness here at the SEVA Foundation and a number of other responsibilities. I'm a big booster for promoting awareness of glaucoma and its treatment. I welcome you on behalf of IAPB and SEVA Foundation and just want to say a word about I, the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. It's the world's largest consortium of organizations working globally to address community level eye health. Uh, the uh, organization has global and regional communications online throughout the year. A very major a uh, skill building and networking meeting is convened for IAPB partner organizations and their staff once a year. And every four years, IAPB sponsors a major global assembly, the next one coming up being in October. And we'll talk about that at the close of the session. I, a few more words about IAPB. Uh, another reason my organizations in the eye health space join IAPB is our very engaged work groups on a number of, of key topics, including having a webinar series such as this during World Glaucoma Week. So we're just delighted that this session is among the six events to mark Glaucoma Week. And the final event will take place about an hour and a half following this one, which is a Glaucoma 2020 lecture being broadcast from London. So for today's webinar, we're going to follow all the customary conventions. Uh, microphones of all the um, uh, registrants are muted, except for the presenters. The session is being recorded and will be available online. Present, eat, uh, the presentations as a group are then followed by one question and answer period during the last 20 minutes of the webinar. In order to inform the Q&A period, we invite you, the registrants, to please type your questions into the Q&A tab at the lower center of your screen. Uh, this will give our chair the opportunity to sort through and group them and make sure they get answered ably by our very expert presenters. As we note, the presenters will respond to questions at the close of the hour. And following the webinar, you'll receive an email requesting feedback. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Alan Robin, the chair of this uh, webinar. Dr. Robin is a clinician and a, a key global opinion leader in glaucoma. Uh, he was instrumental in the development of alpha agonists for glaucoma therapy and high-powered laser iodotomy for angle closure disease. He um, also has done extensive work on glaucoma adherence and has had a very large hand over more than three decades in developing the glaucoma service with colleagues of the Aravind Eye Care System. So uh, it's my great pleasure to ask Dr. Alan Robin to further introduce our topic. Thank you, Alan. Hey, thank you, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to be here today. Can I have the first slide if possible? Uh, I, I'm really very fortunate that some real world experts are with us today in the year of 2020 to promote eye health and prevent needless blindness. Uh, our esteemed faculty is uh, Dr. Mona Kaleem, who's now at the University of Maryland, soon at uh, the Wilmer Institute, Johns Hopkins, 
who's going to be talking about glaucoma detection and trends. Amy Zhang, who is a young star at the University of Michigan, will be talking about how we treat glaucoma problems in the future. And Yvonne Bais, who I'll introduce full in later, just has an article published in Ophthalmology Glaucoma yesterday on the topic of glaucoma during pregnancy and breastfeeding, a very important topic. Why are we talking? Well, we've made tremendous strides in the therapy and diagnosis of glaucoma over the last few years. Glaucoma is different than cataract. It's different than refractive errors, which are main causes of blindness, in that one cannot reverse the problems caused by glaucoma. You can have cataract surgery and give somebody a pair of glasses, but if one has glaucoma and it progresses, it leads to permanent disability. It's a leading cause of blindness in Blacks and Hispanics, but it's more than just black, uh, blindness. People with glaucoma have difficulties in recognizing people, reading, walking, giving up their driver license all, uh, earlier. So there are various stages along the way. There are no symptoms. People with glaucoma have no way of knowing it. So just because you have 20-20 vision doesn't mean you don't have glaucoma. In fact, this morning I spoke with a young person who has a family history of glaucoma who's never had an eye exam. And I was stressing the importance of doing that. There's excellent odds of maintaining your vision and keeping from being blind if you're treated. And so our goal is to help prevent needless blindness. Suzanne? There are facts. In, in the US, there are more than 3 million Americans who have it and over 100,000 people are blind with it. There are significant risk factors for the disease. So if you have a family member with it, if you're over the age of 60, if you're an African American, you are much greater chance of having glaucoma than somebody who isn't. In fact, if you're over 74, an African American has over a 20% chance and a Caucasian has almost a 10% chance of having glaucoma. The objectives of our meeting are to, for you, the public, to have a better understanding of what glaucoma is, how we diagnose it, how we treat it, and what do you do in rare situations, which aren't so rare, where people are glauco or have, or with glaucoma are pregnant or breastfeeding, how do we handle that specific situation? Our first speaker today is Mona Colleen, whose real area of expertise is in the diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma, and is also an expert in low vision and how to handle that. Dr. Kaleem, I'd like you to start talking and I'd like the audience to remember to ask questions in the question box. Hello, good afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending on where you are. So I'm actually gonna start off and talk about trends before detection. So in terms of what we know, glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness around the world. As Alan said, in the United States, we have around 3 million Americans with glaucoma, so around 1.9% of the population, and around 120,000 people who are blind from glaucoma. In terms of how this is changing as time goes on, you can see, if you look at the orange bar there, that in 2010, there are around 2.5 million Americans with glaucoma, and this is expected to increase in 2030 to about 4 million, and then in 2050 to just over 6 million. And the reasons why we see these uh, numbers going up and up, uh, glaucoma is not an infectious condition. It's not something that um, can be transmitted from one person to another. Um, but what we know is that risk factors are things like aging. Um, and as our population is, is aging and people are living longer and well, um, later on and, and longer, uh, we are seeing an increasing number of those uh, with glaucoma. And another risk factor is race. So we know that those who are black or Hispanic have a higher prevalence of glaucoma. And so what this chart is showing you, and, and these come from the National Eye Institute, uh, what it's showing you is that, uh, the, again, the rates, the prevalence rates of glaucoma are increasing. Um, and you see that, that uh, that's increasing, particularly with those as we get older. So, um, uh, and you can see that it's also divided in this uh, graph 
by race and the people who are leading the pack are those who are black and Hispanic. So what is glaucoma? Glaucoma is a condition that affects the optic nerve and it's uh, progressive. It is largely due to an elevated intraocular pressure, which is independent of things like blood pressure. There are some other mechanisms that, that are being worked out in terms of what causes glaucoma. But again, what we know for sure is that an increase in the eye pressure is uh, the number one risk factor for glaucoma and it's a modifiable risk factor. So I mentioned the word cupping in the previous slide. What that refers to is damage of the optic nerve tissue. So I want you to take a look here at the left optic nerve. What you see is like a pink circle. So the pink circle is the optic nerve, that's healthy nerve tissue. And in the center of that pink circle, there's a whitish depression. That's referred to as the cup. Now this is a normal eye. So the ratio of the white or that cup to the nerve, the pink part is around 30% in this photograph. And that's what we consider to be a normal ratio. Now, what can happen over time is that that cup, that white center can increase in size. And as that happens, the nerve tissue uh, is getting, um, uh, it's dying off. And so on the photograph right next to that, you can see an unhealthy optic nerve. This is a patient who has glaucoma. There is an increase in the size of that white depression or the cup. So this is cupping. And we're seeing a loss of that pink circle or the, the healthy nerve tissue. Glaucoma develops because of uh, one of two reasons in, with respect to intraocular pressure. So there is a little gland in the eye that produces the fluid. And so that uh, gland can overproduce the fluid. It's called aqueous humor. Or another reason for uh, having an elevated intraocular pressure is a block in the drainage system of the eye. Uh, so those are the two primary mechanisms of an increase in eye pressure. So you can see the healthy eye, the fluid, the aqueous humor is draining normally in the front of the eye. But you can see in the eye with glaucoma, the arrows are showing that there's an increase in the eye pressure. And that is damaging the optic nerve and uh, developing all of that pressure and causing the damage. A scary fact is that there are usually no symptoms of glaucoma. And the reason why is that glaucoma causes peripheral vision loss generally. And most of the time we're focused more on our central vision. So what can happen over time is that you get like a tunnel vision. It's like looking through a, like a funnel. And so you can still see pretty well uh, in the center. In fact, there are glaucoma patients who preserve 20 20 central vision, but they have no peripheral vision at all, at all. And that can affect things like, as you can imagine, driving or taking a step. Some patients who have a form of glaucoma called angle closure and a few others, but um, uh, primarily angle closure can develop symptoms like a headache. Um, they can also have symptoms including um, halo vision, nausea and vomiting, but those are a lot less common. In the primary form of glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma, there are generally no symptoms. This can affect the vision in several ways. As I mentioned earlier, a loss of the peripheral vision or the visual field can occur, and this can cause blind spots in the vision. Uh, this is usually the first thing that we are checking. Other things that can occur are a loss of contrast sensitivity. So maybe seeing um, variations in color like grays or other hues. And then finally, in very advanced disease, a loss of uh, visual acuity. It is often too late um, once you get to a point of loss of visual acuity. Again, this is kind of a dangerous thing because most people are just uh, they're losing their peripheral vision over time and not paying a whole lot of attention to it. This can affect a person's life. As I mentioned earlier, it can become harder to, if you couldn't see the bottoms of things so well in your vision, you might have a hard time walking. Um, you might fall more. You may develop a fear of falling also because you just, you, you know that you can't see as well and you might become sedentary. Um, other things are driving. Again, imagine if you were driving on a road and you couldn't see the car next to you very well um, because you had blind spots or again, because you had a tunnel vision. Um, this could affect uh, your ability to drive. And uh, glaucoma patients also complain of having slower reading speed. This is a diagram to show at the top someone with a healthy, normal vision, and then what can start happening gradually over time. You can see the vision peripherally of the patient who has early glaucoma, and then finally of a more advanced or severe type of a glaucoma. 
And it's not just the peripheral vision, but we now know that um, you can develop uh, blind spots even in the center of your vision. So you might be able to see okay around those blind spots. But as you can see in this diagram here, the patient actually has uh, a blind spot um, in the center of the vision, uh, just kind of paracentrally, right above the top. There's actually a nice uh, glaucoma simulator on the website for the American Academy of Ophthalmology. The reference is on the bottom if you'd like to take a look at that yourself at home. In terms of who's at risk, we know that there is a disparity with regards to race. Uh, we know that individuals, uh, uh, there is a greater prevalence of in individuals of African descent with having glaucoma and that there's a 15 or sorry, a 15 times higher likelihood of blindness in those of African descent. That's for the most common type of glaucoma, which is open angle. That has to do with open drainage system of the eye. And then the, um, another very uh, common form of glaucoma is angle closure glaucoma. Uh, this, is, this is when there's a block in the drainage system of the eye, and that's the reason for the high eye pressure. Um, uh, in terms of uh, who is um, at greater risk for this, uh, those of Inuit descent, Asians and Caucasians. The risk does increase at the age of 40 and above. And family history is a risk factor. If you have a parent um, who has glaucoma, well, I'm sorry, a, a, a parent who has a history of a childhood form of glaucoma, um, then there is a risk of transmitting this. Also siblings, if you have a sibling with glaucoma, then there's a two to four times uh, or greater risk of getting glaucoma. So how do we diagnose this? How do we detect glaucoma? I recommend a complete eye exam that includes checking the visual acuity, intraocular pressure, and getting a dilated eye exam. We also do visual field testing formally in the office and getting an image of your optic nerve. This is a photograph of someone getting their eye pressure checked. Uh, this machine right here is called Goldman Applination Tonometry. It's considered the gold standard way of measuring intraocular pressure. I would recommend, um, in terms of screening, getting uh, an eye pressure check with uh, this method. Okay, this shows a patient doing a visual field test. And um, so you just look through the box, you'll get a little baton handed to you, which you click every time you see a flicker of light in your peripheral vision. The diagrams at the bottom are showing uh, how the printout of this looks. The one that's all the way um, to the far left, which just shows, shows the black circle, is a normal visual field test. So we all have a blind spot, which is what that black circle is. But over time, this particular individual's peripheral vision declined, and we can see that um, in the other two uh, diagrams there. OK, and this is how we measure the thickness of the optic nerve tissue. So again, just kind of looking through a machine, and then um, on the bottom, you can see how the printout looks. It's really nice. It actually measures the thickness of your optic nerve tissue. So in terms of detecting glaucoma, I would say that the number one thing to do is to come in for a screening eye exam, particularly if you're fitting one of those uh, uh, risk factors that we mentioned. So um, age, uh, black or Hispanic, um, also family history. We should all be getting an eye exam once a year, but. Again, if you have one of those risk factors for glaucoma, I recommend a yearly eye exam. Although there's no cure for glaucoma, we can try to prevent, we can try to catch it early and then prevent the progression. Our goal is really to catch things and to stabilize them to preserve the best vision possible. So I recommend, again, seeing an eye doctor for a yearly exam. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Dr. Cooley. And that was a great talk. And for all who are listening, remember to type in your questions into the Q&A uh, lister in the bottom of the screen. Uh, and at the end of everybody's talk, we will open it up for uh, questions and answers, and I'll be the moderator. Uh, the next speaker is a young superstar from the University of Michigan, Dr. Amy Zhang. She's going to her main interests and areas of expertise are the therapy of glaucoma and she's going to talk about what we do the problems with it and its future amy it's all yours thank you so much alan once again for inviting me to speak i have the pleasure of explaining a little bit more about the glaucoma therapies problems as well as the future let's move on to the next slide please <clears throat> 
Well, I, I think some of this has been reviewed very well by Mona as well as Ellen in terms of the epidemiology for glaucoma. Um, the National Eye Institute quote that there'll be a 58% increase in cases of glaucoma in the U.S. alone by 2030. And worldwide, we're looking at numbers of increasing from 64 million to 76 million in 2020 and 111 million in 2040. Um, having said that, Africa and Asia specifically will be being more affected. Um, so I'm going to talk about with glaucoma, what can we do? Next slide, please. Um, we're going to talk about early detection. Glaucoma is a disease where it can be controlled with medications or surgery. There have been numerous studies that have shown that early treatment can protect eyes against serious vision loss. So some of these modalities of treatment for open angle glaucoma as well as angle closure glaucoma will focus on the reduction of the intraocular pressure. And we do this through a variety of ways, including medications, lasers, and then finally incisional surgeries. So moving on to talking more about this topic of reducing the intraocular uh, pressure, I think Mona had already highlighted a little bit about this fluid that we're talking about that can um, increase the pressure of the eye. So ways in terms of reducing that intraocular pressure is by reducing the amount of fluid that's actually being produced which happens in a structure called the ciliary body, which you can see in the diagram. Um, other ways to increase or reduce the intraocular pressure is by reducing, by increasing the outflow pathways and thereby exiting more fluid out of the eye and therefore reducing the pressure inside the eye. And there are two conventional uh, pathways in which this is done. The conventional pathway is referred to as the trabecular outflow, and this occurs for about 75% of the outflow in the eye. The other pathway is referred to as the uveal scleral outflow, which is responsible for about 25%. And so um, we're what we're, we're going to focus on is actually the traditional medications that work um, with respect to the pathways as well as the inflow and outflow. So traditionally, there are five classes of medications and they're highlighted on the diagram. First being the prostaglandin analogs, which work mostly by increasing the uveal scleral outflow. And the second class of medications, which include the muscarinic agonists, uh, these include medications such as pilocarpine, and this works by increasing the trabecular outflow. The next three classes of medications, which include the beta blockers, the alpha adrenergic agonists, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, all work on decreasing the production of that fluid. You can see some examples of what these typical bottles of medications look like on the slide. Next slide, please. In addition to the traditional medications, there are a few combination agents that are available to combine multi um, classes of medications into one bottle. Uh, this helps to combine and ease compliance for some of our patients. The two main branded combination of agents available in the US include Combigan, which is uh, highlighted first, and it's made up of uh, alpha agonist and a beta blocker. And as you might remember, it is done to decrease the production of the fluid. The next medication is Simbrinza, which is also an alpha, alpha agonist and uh, plus a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which once again works to decrease the production of aqueous. There is one other generic combination agent that is made up of timolol and dorazolamide, and the brand name for that is Cosoft. Next slide, please. So with these medications, there are obstacles uh, with medication use. One of the biggest ones is the increased dosing. Patients do best with once a day dosing. This has been proven in numerous studies that looked at compliance of medications. Um, and when you increase that dosing to multiple times a day, the compliance decreases. Given that we only have a few combination agents that are readily available, um, this is a problem. There are also some common uh, side effects, ocular side effects with 
our current regimen of different medications. And these include hyperemia or redness of the eyes after application of some of these drops. Um, you can see on the right, upper right, there's actually a hyperemia scale in which we classify how much redness a patient gets from these drops. There's also a condition called follicular conjunctivitis, which is an actual allergy to the uh, medications that patients can get, which can make the eyes be more sensitive, irritated. There's also the presence of contact dermatitis, which is another allergic reaction of the skin surrounding the eyes that can also be affected as a result of these eye drops. In addition, there are some systemic side effects that can cause a decrease in the use of these medications, specifically medications like beta blockers, which I've mentioned before, can cause low heart rate problems with breathing and certain central nervous problems such as depression, confusion, hallucinations that definitely occur more commonly in the elderly population, which tends to be the population that we're using these medications in. So next slide, please. Um, so in advent of all these obstacles, there are some um, brighter news in terms of new classes of agents that are now readily available. The last two medications for glaucoma treatment were prostaglandins and alpha agonists, which were approved in 1996. So it's been two decades since we've really had a new option for um, pharmaceutical management for glaucoma. We're constantly looking for management strategies to minimize the patient burden, enhance compliance, and of course, improve quality of life. The essential triad of things that we're looking for include efficacy, tolerability, and simplicity. Best formulas tend to maximize on medication compliance. So with that, uh, we're looking at newer medications. The two new classes include looking at different ways of working on the trabecular outflow to increase the outflow uh, through the conventional pathway. Next slide, please. These new medications offer a once-a-day dosing, which is certainly more favorable for the patient adherence and also minimizing the effects of side effects. Uh, novel combinations will also help with less dosing and increase compliance once again. And also there's the option of preservative-free formulations for those that have allergies to the actual preservatives that are present in our medications. And so moving onward, for those that have progression of disease despite using medications or have an intolerance to medications, there are a few laser modalities that are available for the treatment of glaucoma. I think Mona and Alan briefly touched on that there are different types of glaucoma. For angle closure glaucoma, the typical laser that we use, uh, you, is used to create a hole which allows to um, decrease the blockage of the iris and thereby reduce the intraocular pressure. Next slide. Uh, for other forms of glaucoma which are open angle glaucoma, they look at other uh, laser modalities that focus on treating the trabecular meshwork. In this picture here, it highlights the two various laser modalities that we currently use, which include the argon laser trabeculoplasty, which is the smaller um, key points that you notice. So the laser for the argon tends to be a little smaller in terms of the diameter and the selective laser trabeculoplasty, where they're still focusing on the same angle trabecular meshwork where we're trying to decrease the outflow. But in this case, the laser marks are a little bit larger to help um, the meshwork to decrease uh, that or increase the outflow through the meshwork. Next slide, please. There's also um, traditional surgeries that we work on in case that the lasers are not working and we need to move on to the next step. In this example, it's highlighting uh, our traditional surgery, which is referred to as a trabeculectomy. And what happens during a trabeculectomy is that there's a creation of a flap to allow for fluid to exit and then there's a self-contained blood, which is made from the tissue of the eye to contain the fluid once it exits the eye. In addition to the trabeculectomy, next slide please, we also have the glaucoma drainage devices that also works to filter out the fluid 
uh, of the eye. However, in this case, it's an actual device that we implant into the eye. You can see in the arrow on your left-hand side uh, the, what the tube looks like when we're looking through. And then through that tube, the fluid exits onto the eye, onto the plate. Once again, this would be covered by your own um, tissues as well to contain that fluid. So with some of our traditional surgeries, there are some more complications that are associated given the invasive nature of these therapies. Um, in this slide, it kind of highlights some of these complications that we see. In the upper left slide, there's a leaking of an area uh, of the surgery, um, which can post and cause the patient to have more signs of infection, which is on the upper right. That's supposed to highlight areas of infection from a surgery. Um, there's also the two diagrams on the lower, um, on the bottom of the slide, highlight overfiltration, where our traditional surgeries kind of overfilter the fluid, which can also decrease the vision for the patient. So in light of this, there have been a massive movement towards uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. Uh, in terms of our newer generation of surgical options that are available, um, what these devices and various laser or uh, forms of therapies do is minimize the amount of cutting that is involved. So it minimizes the risk of surgery. Um, in the top diagram, this highlights all the various devices that could be inserted into the trabecular meshwork to increase outflow. Uh, once again, this can be done through a very small incision as opposed to the larger incisions that are needed for our more traditional options. And in the bottom picture, it highlights using either laser or certain um, sutures and blades to also go into the angle structure and open up the outflow uh, through a very small incision um, that's done. So in summary, I wanted to give a little bit of hope um, to the audience that there are a lot of early treatment options that are available to us right now that can decrease the progression to blindness. There are many more medication options that we have available currently than in the past and can delay the need for surgeries. Uh, laser options have also been highlighted that are readily available. And with these differing modalities, we can help their patient, all of our patients maintain their 2020 vision. So the goal I think we shown with the vision with glaucoma, the normal vision and early glaucoma. Next slide, please. Uh, we're hoping that with all these available options, we can stop the advanced glaucoma. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That was a great talk and great reason to see hope to with all the new uh, modalities that are available to us. Uh, it's really optimistic. I can see that there's already a few people who've asked questions in the Q&A box. Please remember to ask questions. This webinar is for you. The next speaker is somebody who I have the utmost respect for. As you notice, we've gone from Maryland to Michigan now up to Toronto, so we're moving north and getting colder as we speak. And the next speaker is Yvonne Bives, who's uh, the co-director of the University Health Network, the president of the Canadian Ophthalmology Society, and a professor at the University of Toronto. We're very, very fortunate to have her on board today. Yvonne, I'd like you to go ahead, and we're interested in hearing about this problem that occurs more and more often uh, nowadays. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you've just learned about what glaucoma is and the various tools we have to manage glaucoma. I'd now like to focus on a specific group of glaucoma patients, which really can be presenting a challenge for the clinician to manage. That's the pregnant and breastfeeding glaucoma patient. We've already heard that glaucoma is usually um, associated with aging. Still, you can see from this prevalence slide here using Canadian data that there are people under 40 who get glaucoma. Young females with glaucoma, congenital glaucoma, juvenile glaucoma, and some secondary types like due to trauma or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. 
These um, also, since women are often delaying pregnancy, this issue of managing a pregnant or breastfeeding glaucoma patient is becoming more common. And although we don't encounter it very often, it does create a lot of um, discussions about what is the best management. In a survey of nearly 300 ophthalmologists from the UK, about a quarter had previously treated a pregnant glaucoma patient, but one third said they were uncertain about what to do in this situation. There are multiple challenges and uncertainties related to the management of the pregnant and breastfeeding glaucoma patient. These include considering the risks of vision loss for the mother, versus the well-being of the baby as one strives to use the least number of medications possible. One must also consider physiologic changes that occur during pregnancy. Most of these studies on eye pressure in pregnant women are from those people who do not have glaucoma. In these studies, we know that in general, eye pressure decreases during pregnancy and returns to normal soon after. However, there are cases of very high eye pressure during pregnancy, and for this reason, these patients need to be followed very closely, maybe every one to three months, depending on the severity of their glaucoma. And finally, due to ethical reasons, we have really very limited evidence-based studies to give us um, suggestions on the best type of management. Current guidance is then based on case series or small retrospective studies, anecdotal experience, and personal biases to liability risk. Communication is important in all areas of medicine, especially here. A discussion of treatment goals, treatment options, and a treatment strategy is important. Treatment decisions should be shared with the entire health team, including the family physician, obstetrician, pediatrician, and others. Pregnancy might alter the course of glaucoma, so a tailored close follow-up is recommended. This should be considered within the framework of preconception, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. And ideally, the conversation would have started early in this process. Most physicians are familiar with this FDA classification system. In 2015, a new pregnancy and lactation labeling rule was implemented, requiring more descriptive labeling, meaning that medications approved after 2001 are no longer classified this way. Since most glaucoma medications were introduced prior to 2001, this older labeling system still remains useful. The categories range from A to E, safest to contraindicated. There are no category A glaucoma medications. At the present time, bromonidine or alphagan is the safest glaucoma medication for use during pregnancy and is category B. Bromonidine, however, is known to cause central nervous system depression in the newborn and young children and should be stopped near the time of delivery and during breastfeeding. Most of the other medications are category C, meaning there are no adequate human studies, but some studies showing risk in animals. Glaucoma medications taken by nursing mothers can be found in breast milk and could potentially harm newborns. This slide summarizes which drops are considered safe when breastfeeding. Since eye drop levels in breast milk are highest at 30 minutes to two hours after putting a drop in the eye, if possible, medication should be administered just after nursing. Some overarching principles in the medical management of glaucoma in this group of patients is to evaluate the risk both of the medication and eye pressure control because you might want to run pressures a little bit higher at this time just because of risks to the baby and an attempt to decrease the number of medications. 
and always remember nasolacrimal occlusion. This is a technique where you can greatly decrease the amount of medication that gets into the body by applying pressure where your eyelids come together. This can stop drugs from getting into the back of the throat and into the bloodstream. This should be done for three to five minutes. Another technique is just gently closing your eye will achieve the same results. As mentioned earlier, when breastfeeding, try to time the installation of drops to after a breastfeeding session. Laser trabeculoplasty may seem an attractive option to decrease or eliminate the needs of medications. However, there are important limitations in this group of patients. First, you need to have an open angle, and many of our younger people with glaucoma have congenitally abnormal angles, may have had previous multiple surgeries, or a history of inflammation and would be ineligible for this treatment. Also, laser trabeculoplasty is known to be less effective in younger patients. Before considering surgery in a pregnant glaucoma patient, all other available safe alternatives to lowering the eye pressure should be tried first. There is a high risk of failure of surgery due to young age and the inability to use medications that influence healing, namely anti-metabolites. This might also influence your choice of procedure. In addition, there are issues related to the drugs used during the anesthesia and postoperatively. And finally, patient positioning may be an issue, as surgery is normally done with the patient lying on their back, and for some individuals in advanced stages of pregnancy, this may be not possible. So in summary, a discussion of treatment goals, treatment options, and treatment strategy should ideally be held in the preconception period. Treatment decisions should be shared with the entire healthcare team. Pregnancy might alter the course of glaucoma, so a tailored close follow-up is recommended. Drops can be safely administered and laser therapy can be safely performed in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Glaucoma surgery is rarely required during pregnancy. Sleeping position and delivery method choice are unlikely to cause clinically meaningful pressure increases. And drops should be administered with nasolacrimal occlusion and closely after a feeding session when breastfeeding. As Alan mentioned, we recently published a practical guide to the pregnant and breastfeeding glaucoma patient. And for anyone interested in more detailed information, this can be found in the journal Ophthalmology Glaucoma. Thank you. Yvonne, thank you so much. And thank you, Amy, and thank you, Mona. These are great talks and I think give the audience the basis of understanding what glaucoma is, how we manage it in some special situations. Uh, we have a few moments now, we have 15 minutes for questions. We've already received five of them. And I'd like to start out uh, asking Dr. Kaleem, what's a good eye exam? You said that people should be checked intermittently. And what does it mean when you have a, what, 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 is, what are the parts of a adequate eye examination for glaucoma? I highly recommend, in terms of a screening for glaucoma, I highly recommend getting a measurement of the intraocular pressure and ideally that should be done in the clinic using Goldman applination planometry, which was the photograph that I showed earlier. The other methods of checking intraocular pressure can be less reliable, which include things like an automated handheld machine. Um, it, it can uh, get a fairly good measure of eye pressure, but it's always ideal to get checked in the clinic. I also recommend getting a dilated eye exam to get a good look at the optic nerve. Thank you, Dr. Colleen. Uh, if you just get your vision checked, is that enough? Um, no. If you, okay. I do not think getting uh, visual acuity checked uh, alone is enough. I, again, um, would underscore the importance of the eye pressure reading and the dilated eye exam. 
Dr. Baez, one of the questions that we've received is, can you have glaucoma only in one eye? And if you do, why, why, why does that happen? Um, absolutely, you can. Glaucoma can have an asymmetric presentation. So it could start in one eye first, and then later on you can see it in the other eye. But one of the most common reasons that I see glaucoma in only one eye is after trauma. And this trauma could be like trauma on the street that we normally think of, or having had surgery to an eye. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in the same breath, if I am a young woman uh, and thinking about uh, having children but am, have glaucoma, should I forget about having kids? What, what should I do? genetically? Should I uh, not have any treatment? What, what, what would your advice be to me? So I think that if you are a young woman and you want to have a family, you should right away start having those discussions with your ophthalmologist. Absolutely, women with glaucoma can have children. And as I've mentioned during my presentation, there are some challenges, but I've had a lot of successful pregnancies of uh, my patients. The other issue is that a lot of these patients have congenital glaucoma. So uh, another concern is, is my child going to have glaucoma? And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. These children should be seen at a young age by a pediatrician and an ophthalmologist because they are at higher risk of glaucoma. Uh, how would you know that your child had glaucoma? If, let's say you just delivered a child yesterday, uh, how would you know? Can you do the same kind of test that you do on a grown-up? Well, the tests are obviously a little bit more challenging to do in children, but you can do similar tests of measuring eye pressure. When children are very young, this can be done um, without sedation, but when they get a bit older, you may need to use sedation. Um, the Childhood eye is a bit different as well. Sometimes when eye pressure gets elevated, the eye compensates by becoming larger. So measurements then are made of the, the eye, the structures in the front and the actual length of the eye that may give some guidance if a child has glaucoma or not. Also, as children get a little bit older, not from the right away newborn, but a little bit later, they will be focusing on things and parents usually can tell if their child is having a vision problem. And if the mom feels the child is not seeing, that child definitely needs to be seen by an ophthalmologist. Huh. Hey, th thank you, Dr. Baez. Uh, Dr. Zhang, one of the questions that's co come up is uh, for the five classes of medications you brought up, can there be any long-term health effects of any of these classes? So I think that's a great question. Obviously, there's a lot of local side effects or ocular side effects with our medications, but some of them can be long-term. So in terms of uh, prostaglandins in general, there is a small slide, I think, um, in one of my slides, which actually highlighted there could be a color change to your iris. This is specifically for patients that have lighter colored irises. So I typically tell my patients that kind of have hazel eyes or eyes that are a little bit, not completely blue, but kind of have a slight tint of hazel to it, that there is a chance that the prostaglandin analogs could actually change the eye color permanently to being brown. Um, now brown eyes will stay brown and truly blue eyes will stay blue. Um, even without, uh, even with the use of the prostaglandins. In terms of systemic effects of these medications long-term, because of the uh, small absorption, as Dr. Bides had mentioned with the na nasal lacrimal duct occlusion, as well as just gently closing your eyes, there's actually not that much systemic absorption of these medications. So even though you are applying these medications on a daily basis over a long periods of time, systemically, there's not that much um, absorption. So overall, I don't think 
you'll have long-term consequences. However, as I did mention for beta blockers in particular, that is something that we have to be very cognizant of and kind of watch for very carefully in our elderly population because even with small systemic absorption, it can cause a big drop in their heart rate. It can cause confusion problems, hallucination. And as Dr. Baez also mentioned with bermonidine or alpha, um, agonists, you do see a problem with definitely not using that in children under five. Thank you very much. And another question for you, uh, Dr. Zhang, is somebody wanted to know how many lasers can you have? And I assume they're talking about trabeculoplasties, uh, so let's make that assumption. Okay, so once again, great question. Um, some doctors will tell you as many as you want. No, just kidding. Um, all kidding aside, I think it depends on, you know, whether we're seeing an effect. So in terms of how we tailor our therapy, we're looking at the effects of the laser. So the laser is not just to do for the sake of doing, but we have to see, does it actually decrease your intraocular pressure afterwards? And how long is that effect sustained? Um, there have been papers looking at selective laser trabeculoplasty being repeated uh, multiple times. I don't think there's a really set number of the number of times that it can be done, but certainly if it's no longer efficacious or if you're starting to notice problems with inflammation related to laser and, or progression of the visual field on your um, exam, then perhaps it's time to move on to either incisional surgery or some other modalities of treatment. Thank, thank you. Um, Dr. Baez, one of the questions that just came in, is there a different nor or is there a different interocular pressure range in an infant compared to that in an adult? So there are very few studies that would show intraocular pressure ranges in infants. There are some studies in children and they show really it's about the same as in an adult with the average pressures being around 16 millimeters mercury and the range of around 10 to 28 millimeters mercury. I think this just brings to mind cautioning using pressure to diagnose glaucoma because you can have individuals who have pressures above 21 who never get glaucoma and then you do have individuals with pressures of 10 who are going blind from glaucoma. So we need to remember that eye pressure is merely a risk factor, but a very important one because it's the only modifiable risk factor, but it is a risk factor for glaucoma, but doesn't necessarily diagnose glaucoma. I think that's an excellent point. I think that's something that I'm glad you clarified that if you look at most of the studies looking at the prevalence or how frequent the disease is, half of the people in both in the US, Canada, and Americas, as well as in Asia who have glaucoma have pressures that are below 21. And so it's not unlikely that somebody can have glaucoma with a very low pressure. Well, one of the questions, uh, Dr. Pauline, that just came up, and it was a personal story, and also dealt with pressure. Uh, if somebody seems like they're stable, uh, how often should they be checked? According to the uh, preferred practice patterns uh, written by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, a stable glaucoma patient should get checked every six months. Now, that is for someone who sees out of both eyes I personally recommend that if someone um, does not see well um, out of one eye, meaning um, no vision in one eye or has an advanced form of glaucoma, uh, so again, monocular or has an advanced form of glaucoma, I would recommend being seen every four months. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bice, again, there's a question on, uh, are, there any, are there restrictions on the nitric oxide containing drops for pregnancy and breastfeeding? Yes, so the nitrous oxide medications are contraindicated because there are animal studies that um, show defects at not very high doses. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, somebody asked, and uh, Dr. Zane, this I think would be best for you, 
what are some of the better strategies for managing glaucoma and dry eyes? I think that's a great question. I think so many of our patients have um, coexisting issues and certainly a lot of our glaucoma medications have preservatives that are not helpful to the corneal epithelium. And so we tend to see dry eyes even more commonly in our glaucoma patients. I think some of those strategies could um, for controlling glaucoma in those patients would be focusing on some of the preservative free options that are available. If those are still not viable or um, the patient still cannot tolerate or the pressure is still not controlled, we can look at other modalities such as laser to help decrease the intraocular pressure without having to apply more medications to the ocular surface. Oh, thank you. A another question that just popped up, and we still have a, a few minutes left, is the strategy or the therapeutic uh, strategy for treating normal tension glaucoma different from that of treating people with open angle glaucoma with more elevated eye pressure? So I think with normal tension glaucoma, because the eye pressure tends to be in the normal range, um, it, it's hard to come up with that target eye, eye pressure reading for those patients. So I think for those patients that have the normal tension, it is even more important that we review the visual fields and other forms of testing, such as the um, nerve scanning modalities that Dr. Kaleem had talked about with OCT imaging to make sure that the thickness of the optic nerve um, is not changing too rapidly for those patients and also monitoring them for any signs of visual field deficits that are presenting. So I tend to think that for normal tension glaucoma patients, we should see those patients more frequently. We should be more aware of the presence of um, certain optic nerve hemorrhages that may present. Um, I think you can't just look at the number alone in that case uh, because their numbers in terms of their in actual intraocular pressures always look to be fairly good, but it's whether the patient feels themselves if their vision is changing, if they notice any changes, and also the more frequency with visual field testing. Okay, and we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, Dr. Bies, one of the questions that just came up uh, was, are there any foods or activities that can help ward off glaucoma or help you do better if you do have glaucoma? That's a very common question that we hear from our patients. And really, in terms of foods, there is no food that will make your glaucoma better. But in general, we always encourage people to have a healthy diet. Um, and try to have a healthy weight because higher weight is associated with higher eye pressure. In activities, we don't want to have a prolonged head down activity. And I think most people don't do a lot of inversion therapy. But for people doing yoga, for instance, you may not want to be doing those positions where your head is down for a prolonged period of time. Um, there are nuances in glaucomas, like pigmentary glaucomas, where they may have showers of pigments and raised eye pressure with um, activities with jolting in their body. So in those patients, sometimes you may want to be counseling about running. I've also done a lot of studies during sleep. We spend a lot of our time sleeping, lying flat, and we know as our head gets lower, eye pressures go higher. So sometimes, especially maybe in these patients with low pressure glaucoma, who are continuing to deteriorate despite having very good pressures, I have on occasion recommended to try sleeping with their head a little bit elevated, because we do know that that can lower their eye pressure. I would like to caution you though, that there are no studies that show that that influences the progression of glaucoma, but it might be something to consider. Thank you, Yvonne. I'd like to thank all the speakers. There's still more questions, but regrettably, we don't have more time to address them. I think this has been very informative, and I'm very hopeful that now with all our newer diagnostic methods, better facts on things like treating pregnant and breastfeeding women, 
on knowing more about the prevalence of glaucoma and having new therapies, new surgeries, that we will definitely be able to, uh, to eliminate needless blindness in the future. I'd like to thank the audience for all their questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of you. Uh, and remember, for all of you, there is an International Association for Prevent Blindness meeting in October in Singapore. I'm actually heading one of the sessions and I hope you could all make it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.